Welcome to Advent Sunday. Today we start to tell the story of Jesus all over again from a different gospel writer's point of view and this year it's from Matthew's perspective. But through the Sundays of Advent I want to reflect on the Old Testament readings set for each week. If we don't know the background to the nativity scene we'll find ourselves dropping in on the stable on Christmas morning with no context to help us understand what's happening. Who is this baby and what has he come to do? Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into ploughshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Advent is a composite word from the Latin ad, meaning towards, and vent, come. Advent comprises the four weeks before Christmas. The candles on the Advent wreath tell chapters of the Christmas story, which starts millennia before we get to the stable. Advent candles remind us of God's promise to bless the world. The fulfilment of God's promise comes towards us. The fun thing about an advent wreath is that as you light a candle each week, first one, then two, then three, then four, then the one in the middle, the story visibly gets nearer and nearer. So by the time it comes to that last white candle, the one that represents Jesus, you're on tiptoes to look into the stable. So next week, week two of Advent, God comes to his people, refreshing his promise of grace through Isaiah and other prophets. Week three, God comes 400 years later, to his people, refreshing his promise of grace through John the Baptist, who literally points to Jesus in person on the horizon. And very nearly finally, week four, God comes to Mary. Mary, in a very special way, gives us God's promise. In the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh, Jesus, full of grace and truth. That's the white candle in the middle. Grace and truth are the two watchwords of Advent. But this week is the candle that represents Abraham. In the light of the increasing arrogance of humanity, God finds a single man who is humble enough to listen to him and, well, faithful. This is the man to whom God will make his promise to bring blessing back to his self-harming world. Abraham's, as yet non-existent, family will kick off generations of descendants who would one day form a nation from which Jesus will come. And he will be the blessing for the world. Now, why does God make this promise? Back at the very beginning of the story, when Adam and Eve decided to do their own thing independently of God and fell from glory. You can't fall from grace because grace covers the shortfall. God made a promise there and then to destroy Hasatan, the devil, the father of lies, as Jesus called him. Satan had questioned what God had said and deceived Adam and Eve into thinking they could have more than they already had. This is what God said to the serpent who is representing the devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. It rather looks as if this little baby is in time going to see off humanity's arch enemy, Hasatan, the deceiver. What a strange place to start the story. But we have to know why Jesus came and what he'd come to do. Or the story just nestles in straw and school nativities. 
I think we see the Christmas story as a rather domestic story, a story for the church, a story for the kids, a story for insiders. Actually, it's not our story. It's God's story. It's a universal story that concerns everyone, the whole of the universe, space and time, everybody on the planet. So let's dig ourselves out of thinking that Jesus is only being a reality for those who believe or for minority. This is a tidal wave God has set in motion. For the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea, Habakkuk said. So back to our reading, Isaiah 2. Although next week's candle represents the prophets, our reading today from Isaiah shows him to be an extraordinary visionary. Not only does he see Jesus' birth and ministry and death, he sees on and beyond to Jesus' return to glory and the Holy Spirit coming in his place. And that's the story of Pentecost. It's almost the punchline of the story. It's like we're being invited to see the end from the beginning. Now, I love the seasons of the liturgical year, but we can't let the boxes belonging to each season stop us from making links between them. Pentecost is directly related to Abraham because Abraham leads to Pentecost and the fulfilment of the prophecy we read today. Yeah, for those who enjoy the church colours associated with each season, I'm mixing purple and red. Isaiah spoke God's word for about 40 years. Although his vision was for Judah and Jerusalem, Isaiah saw on and beyond himself into the distance, the far distance. Now, why might we think Isaiah is looking on and beyond his own time in history. Well, in history, Mount Zion was never the highest of the mountains. And in his time, all nations never streamed to it. On the contrary, those who lived in Jerusalem were taken out of the land into Babylon for 70 years worth of exile. And there hasn't yet been actual peace and prosperity in the city of Jerusalem. This promise, of course, remains in the hearts of Israeli people today, but God has moved on in his story. His people have become worldwide, not localised. Now, if you can cope with looking as far ahead as Pentecost, you will find this promise in Isaiah 2 substantially fulfilled. It's a promise to bring order out of chaos. It's a promise of peace. Which of us doesn't see peace as the ultimate blessing God could give? Jerusalem means city of peace. The new Jerusalem is a new city of peace. Or is that a city of new peace? Let's link it with Pentecost. When the story of the Holy Spirit coming to the Gentiles filtered through to the central hub of the first century church in Jerusalem, they finally accepted that God's plan had always been for all humanity, not just for the Jews. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west and sit down in the kingdom of God. The temple, the meeting place of God and humanity, otherwise known as Zion, has become Jesus. He is the place of sacrifice and priesthood and forgiveness and peace with God. And by extension through the Holy Spirit, that place on earth is the church, living stones. Isaiah 2. All nations shall stream to it, the mountain of God, the place where Jesus was raised up on a cross. Jesus said, when I am raised up, I shall draw all people to myself. Is this the mountain? Listen to Acts 2 verse 5. Devout Jews from every nation under heaven, living in Jerusalem, came together for the feast of Pentecost. Peter preaches a long sermon based on the Old Testament. The word of the Lord goes out from Jerusalem. And the result is that many were added through gates of pearl, stream in the countless host. Well, 3,000 extra people. That was just a starter. Isaiah 2. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning, pruning hooks. Order out of chaos, peace instead of power struggle. Acts 2. Describes the united and supportive and peaceful life of the church. That wasn't perfect. 
But listen to this. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. So where is the peace? in the church. Question. Whence comes the promised time when war shall be no more and lust, oppression, crime shall flee his face before? Answer. The church. Church history is peppered with human power struggles, lust, oppression and crime. Bickering. Where you see those things you are not seeing the church. Why do you think Jesus gave instruction on how his followers were to resolve disputes? Why do you think Paul wrote so much about the priority of unity in churches or described the peaceful way churches were supposed to order their relationships? Seek peace and pursue it, Paul wrote. He also wrote, well, read Romans 12 and 15 to discover just how churches work out peace in practice. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. And Paul's prayer from Romans 15. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul describes the characteristics of a follower of Jesus in Galatians 5. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. So this is the fulfilment of Isaiah 2. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And yet the complete fulfilment of God's promise is yet to be seen. Advent becomes a two-pronged season. It precedes Jesus' first coming as a baby to light up a dark world. We're waiting for him to come. But it also resonates with Jesus' second coming in great glory and majesty to light up a dark world. We're waiting for him to come. Of course, when you switch on the light, you reveal the truth of what's in the darkness and that brings its own judgment. So... Is the expectation of Jesus' return a threat or a promise? Both. Remember that he has promised to put our world to rights. That's the promise, the promise of peace. But there is an urgency to Advent. We don't know when Jesus is going to return. He could interrupt my next sentence, which would be the most massive visual aid for a sermon I think I ever had. O2 Priority offers one free cinema ticket per week at the Odeon. The freebies come online at 2pm on a Wednesday, so here I am online with one second to go. I'm there with my finger on the button. There's a choice. Use now or save it. I decide to make sure Rosemary knows the tickets are online, so I press save it, then send her a message which says, tickets online. And that's all I say. I go back to the website to use my saved ticket. I get the message out of stock. I can't use it. The maximum number of available tickets has been claimed by people across the country. I could have used it there and then so easily. Much gnashing of teeth. The message of Advent is very much like that. Use now. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Now is the time. Now is the day. If you wait till later, the opportunity to be part of this story, this future, this peace may disappear. I know Jesus' return hasn't happened for 2,000 years, 
So why should it suddenly happen in our lifetime? Well, it was the hope of every Christian generation that Jesus should come back. It was the hope of the writers of the Bible. It's the last verse of the Bible. It's our hope today. Wake up and smell the coffee, Advent says. It will happen. to pause this video for your own prayer and reflection, maybe even light that first candle on your advent wreath. God of Abraham and Sarah and all the patriarchs of old, you are our Father too. Your love is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of David. As we prepare to celebrate his birth, may your Holy Spirit help us to welcome him. We ask this through Jesus Christ the light who is coming into the world. Almighty God, as your kingdom dawns, turn us from the darkness of sin to the light of holiness, that we may be ready to meet you in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.